Yes. All right. Well, I, I think we can go ahead and get started. So I want to say happy Friday sure. to everyone and welcome to this Friday's Ask and Answer with the Nonprofit Show. And we want to thank our exclusive sponsor for this Ask and Answer session, the Fundraising Academy at National University. And um, we also want to thank um, Muhi Kwaja, who's joining us, who's a trainer at the Fundraising Academy and also the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. So we're glad to have you here again. And for folks that tuned in um, to our last conversation that we had together, um, he's still in the same place. So he's, he's living his best life in, in Peru. I'm, I'm joining you from Atlanta at the moment. Um, and so hopefully folks from all over are able to join us wherever you are. And I am Miko Marco Whitlock. For those who don't know, I am the founder and CEO of Mindful Techie. I'm a workplace well-being strategist and trainer. I work specifically with mission-driven professionals just like you. And I'm excited to be here today to help facilitate another exciting conversation to really ask and hopefully provide some helpful answers for a lot of the questions that you have today. Um, I also want to note that we have an amazing panel of co-hosts that join us throughout the week for other episodes. So we invite you to tune in and to be a part of the conversation and get a chance to, to get a sense of the feel and flavor for some of the other co-hosts that we have that we're very fortunate to have be a part of this um, conversation that we have every day. We also wanna thank our presenting sponsors. So we have Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, the Nonprofit Thought Leader, um, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, staff and boutique, GMT, GMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. All right, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and dive into the grab bag today and see what we have. And it looks like we have our first question here from Jaden. Um, City is anonymous, but um, the question is this, and, and we, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see you know, what your thoughts are as we, as we kick this off. So. Have you ever heard of a board member being fired? We have a board member who is not showing up to meetings, attending meeting, ses meeting sessions, and has not met the give or get. Can you help us determine how to move them off the board? Uh, such a great question. I've served on a number of boards, and I've seen lots of different dynamics play out as it relates to this, but I'm curious, I mean, what are your thoughts? What's your experience in this area? Yeah, you know, uh, at AMCF, we try to keep a well-balanced approach to engaging our board. Um, our board president is, you know, weekly, bi-weekly in touch with our staff. Um, and we are revitalizing our board to meet monthly. Um, and we've had waves over the last six, seven years of um, people who weren't as active, you know, health things, family things, different commitments come up, uh, and they've asked to take a leave of absence, or they've asked to resign. And we said, well, why don't we give you a few months, see how life balances out. And we really like your skill set on our board and commitment to the organization. Um, but it seems like this scenario is very different. They're not showing up. They're not coming to sessions. They haven't given or helped fundraise. Uh, and I think that just as you vote in board members, you should be able to vote out board members. Um, so at your next meeting, if you have quorum, uh, that is what I would suggest to do. Obviously, first have a conversation with the board uh, member specifically, or somebody who's close to them on the board, maybe see what's going on, what the reason is, uh, before you just go to axing them from the board. Um, so that would be my advice. Awesome. So there's a there's a lot of good stuff there. And I would, you know, as I think about this, I would sort of hone into that piece of advice you just gave about really starting with that conversation. I think sometimes in these situations, we can begin to make assumptions and make up stories about why this person's doing that or, or this. And I think you, we just don't know what is happening in this person's life or what's happening in their work. And so I think it's worth having a conversation to say, hey, like we've, we've noticed um, that you haven't been shown up to meetings. We're just checking in. We're really concerned. You know, is there anything that we can do to support? And then really reiterating what the expectations are. Um, and if 
there's an opportunity for, I guess, remediation or for that person to sort of do a, a reset. I think that is something that can come up in that conversation. Or it might be something similar to what you just shared at the top of your response, which is that this person might actually share, you know what, you know, I'm at a really particularly busy or hectic point in my life or my work. I'm actually realizing that in this season, I do not have the capacity. I still want to support the organization. Um, but in this season, that's just not possible. Right. And you all can sort of come to an agreement. Right. My, in my experience serving on boards, um, you know, we, re we recognize that we have humans that are sort of involved in, in both sides of this process. And um, in many cases, I think just actually having the conversation, you would be surprised, right? Um, as opposed to just simply making assumptions. Um, the other part is I wanna say is that there, there should be clear bylaws in place about what happens in this particular situation and like what is the authority of the board chair and the executive committee. And so this shouldn't be something that is a surprise for the board member in particular that's involved. Um, and this this should be something where the board and, and or staff liaison, um, particularly the board chair, should be really checking in on a regular basis and really taking the pulse of, of, of whether people are actively engaged or not, really checking people's pulse and, and sort of seeing how, what is their board experience? How can we be, what can we be doing to continuously improve? Um, so this should not be, it, from my perspective, just a surprise conversation that you sort of just like, oh my God, you just noticed this and you all of a sudden want to take action. This should be something that should be part of an ongoing um, conversation that hopefully doesn't get to a point where you're having to kick someone off and it becomes like a surprise or becomes like a contentious um, back and forth. Um, so hopefully, Jaden, that is helpful. And Mui, is there anything else you wanted to add um, before we move to the next question? Um, no, I think, you know, a little bit to kind of see what you can do to mitigate this, having an honest conversation ahead of uh, their commitment before they sign the NDA, before they sign the contract, before they agree to join the board and be on the team for two years, three years, however long the term is, talking to them through these situations and seeing what they uh, would like to do in case of something coming up. Um, and seeing what those opportunities are. Absolutely. And I, you know, again, just want to underscore like what you just shared, I, I think it should be in writing and it should be something that people agree to assign or sign off on before they join the board. Um, another thought that comes up as I was listening to you is really considering, because I think the way this question is framed is framing it as if the this particular board member may be doing something wrong. But I think a question to ask is, is there a dynamic or an environment created by the board or the organization that might be contributing to how this person is showing up or not showing up? So I, I think it's an opportunity just to collect some information and with the ultimate goal of figuring out how can the board be more effective as a body to help advance the mission of the organization. And I think when you think of it that way, it becomes less personal, like this person is doing this thing and as a result of it, I feel this way and it's more here's what the impact is, here's where we're trying to go, how can we work together to get there, even if that means that this person no longer serves on the board. All right, awesome. So lots of, um, I think lots of things to chew on there. So thank you, Jaden, for that question. A really interesting one, and I think a very important because sometimes I think we are conflict avoidant. And when we do that, sometimes it can have a detrimental impact on the teams and organizations that we serve. All right, so the next one's up here. So from Sharon from Boston, Massachusetts. So Sharon says, I am working on my personal fundraising portfolio and I have been asked to set my own goals, which will be reviewed. This is normal for me. This year, I have been asked to determine a percentage of loss, the number of donors in my portfolio who will leave us or not donate. How do I even calculate this in any ideas. So this seems to be really sort of inside baseball for fundraisers. So I'm wondering before you dive into this movie, could you just unpack what this person is asking in terms of the percentage of loss? Yeah, I think um, what it seems like to me is donor attrition. You know, okay. what amount of your portfolio is not going to give. Um, and looking at the data year over year, you know, if you've been uh, looking at setting your own goals 
uh, you were probably focusing on retention. So really, what's the opposite of that equation? Um, and, you know, it's not to say that you need to remove them from your portfolio if uh, this donor does not give uh, in that calendar year or fiscal year, but maybe if it's been two years or three years, definitely it needs to be some reason why they haven't been engaged, uh, they haven't given again, um, but sometimes it's in the data. Maybe they changed their method of giving. They made a stock gift instead of a check, um, or maybe they donated at an event and it was put under a spouse's name. Um, so all of these things can happen, but typically when you are looking at percentage of loss, uh, to me, that means donor attrition. Um, and it would just be looking at how many people have not given to you in that time frame, And that's how you would calculate it. So look at your portfolio, look at it historically, see what gifts are missing. Um, and, you know, some national averages and rates must be out there for what's normal for donor retention, what's normal for donor attrition, uh, and try to see where your portfolio or your organization stands against that. Awesome. And I, I would add to this as a non-fundraiser, um, just thinking about sort of backing out of this a little bit and thinking about, you know, you're not the first person to, to do this, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So what are the organizations or groups that you're a part of in terms of your fundraising colleagues, um, even folks that your peers at other organizations sort of reaching out to maybe ask this question and get some feedback on how they are, are thinking about this. Um, another question I have for you, Mui, as we move forward from this question is, um, how does someone like Sharon actually, once they've calculated what this percentage of loss is or this attrition rate, um, what do you actually do with that? Like, does it just sit on a piece of paper with your goals for that calendar year? Or do you actually actively use it as a way to sort of make adjustments in terms of how you're performing? How, like, what do you do with that information? Yeah, you know, let's say if you have a portfolio of 200 people, or let's say less than that, um, you know, 150 people in your portfolio, um, and you have a goal of $1 million to raise, major gift at your organization is... $10,000 and above, um, but about, um, you know, your retention has been good, but you're trying to figure out your attrition rate. Um, you're looking at who has not given in the last year. Are they going to give before the end of the fiscal year, the calendar year? Uh, what strategies are in place? Are you segmenting that list? Are you reaching out to them in different ways? Um, are you inviting them to opportunities to meet with program managers, volunteers, beneficiaries, give them a tour, um, and any opportunity to engage them in the mission? Um, so those are the things that I would be doing differently for that segment of my portfolio. Uh, you know, in the industry, we call it lie bunt or side bunt. They've given last year, but not this year, or some years, but not this year. Um, so thinking of ways in which uh, you can be more proactive in retaining that donor. Excellent. So that's super helpful because it sounds like there's maybe you have a strategy for folks that you're trying to engage or re-engage, right? And there's a strategy for folks that you are sort of including in this attrition category. And it sounds like there's a different strategy that you might employ um, to uh Get, get at those folks. So that's, that's super helpful. So thank you for that. So Sharon, hopefully that is helpful and you have some insights from Mui and myself, and you also have an opportunity to, if you aren't already, to engage with your colleagues and see how they are going about this process um, for their organizations. All right, so our next question here is from Marcus from Little Rock, Arkansas. And Marcus's question is this, so we have been offered a large value contract by a mid-sized ad agency from our community. The contract is pro bono. I'm concerned that because we won't be paying cash for services, we won't get strong work or quick responses. How do we structure this deal? So I have lots of thoughts of, on this based on my work as a former communications director 
managing some of these types of projects, but I'm curious maybe if you have any thoughts or any experience with these types of projects. Yeah, I might lean on you for this one, but what I would say is in terms of structuring the deal, see what the cadence of meeting is. Is it an hour bi-weekly? Is it a half hour weekly? Um, that way you will at least be getting in front of your point of contact for the ad agency. Uh, you want to be looking, you know, building out what those ads look like, what the keywords are, what the uh, click-through rate is, what the success is, and then be able to track that um, month over month and see how responsive the ads are performing so that you can engage and come back to the team as well. Um, so I'll pass it back over to you on this one to provide more insight. Yeah, so I I um, I think those thoughts are, are pretty solid and I would just expand upon that and offer for, for Marcus to really uh, take a step back and to recognize that, yes, it's important to spell out the details in the contract. Um, I don't know how much teeth ultimately that has because it's pro bono. Um, and so I think a good approach paired with sort of getting clear about the contract and expectations is on the front end of this engagement really sitting down with the team, expressing the concerns that you just expressed to us. Like I think you can have, if you're working with a good contractor and they've done this type of work before with other organizations, they're gonna likely be open to having that honest and frank conversation. They're gonna be able to probably share with you what has worked well and what hasn't worked well with other engagements. I know having been a consultant and doing this type of work, one of the things that often holds up the process is the person on the organizational side is doing this in addition to their already set plate of duties. And so they haven't budgeted in the weekly calls that you talked about. They haven't budgeted in the time to provide timely feedback to the consultant or the agency. And so by the time they get around to it, the, the agency or the consultant, they have to move on to other projects that they already have in queue. And so it, and, and, and they're trying to shoehorn you in on the back end. And so, um, having that conversation with the agent that you're working with, understanding how they work to your point, what is the cadence of meetings? What is the, what is the response process look like? How many revisions are included? You know, what are the things that you can do to set yourself up for success? And then from the, from the organizational perspective, I would invite you to consider, especially because this is, this is pro bono and you have this anxiety that you might not be as high a priority, which may or may not be true. Um, but, asking yourself, what are the ways in which you can make yourself easier to work with, right? What are the ways in which you can be flexible recognizing this? Um, what are the ways that you can um, really understand this agency's flow and how to get into that flow? And I think that's really going to require you to be um, proactive as opposed to reactive, right? So in this, in this particular instance in particular, my sense is that it's not gonna be enough to simply be reactive every time the agency reaches out. You're gonna to have to take a proactive role in sort of driving the process forward um, and sort of anticipating needs and meeting those needs um, ahead of time. And it sounds like you have a good sense of what you wanna get out of this engagement. And I think that's good. Um, and I think it's really assessing what do you have the capacity to do um, and how are you building this into your regular flow of work so that you can build in that per action and make it a win-win relationship for both you and the the ad agency. Um, do you have additional thoughts that you wanna to add to this for Marcus? All right, awesome. So Marcus, hopefully that that has been helpful. Um, one other thought that I would add to you, there's a community called NTEN. So if you go to nten.org, it's a community for nonprofit tech professionals. Uh, and you have folks in different organization sizes, different roles that have experience um, managing and these types of projects. And so you can pop up to the forum over there, which is free, um, and maybe ask your question there and see if you can get some uh, more direct peer-to-peer -peer feedback about how other peers uh, in similar organizations might be handling this type of engagement. All right, so let's move us forward. And... We have a question from Rafael from San Diego, California. And this question says, in an effort to retain more of our employees, we are exploring personal development options. 
we need to start with the budget and it is looking like maybe $500 per person per calendar year. Should we state upfront what personal development is and is not? Frankly, we have never had this and not sure how to proceed. I have thoughts about this one as well, having managed these types of projects and, and types of budgets, but I'm curious if you have a thought, just putting your hat on as like fundraising, professional development expert, like what are your thoughts when you, when you see this question? Well, Raphael, I think it's a great start. Uh, I think that there's more that can be done. I think each individual employee should identify whether they're going to use it or not. And it should also go into a pool or a budget for the rest of the team in case they have more than $500 worth of personal development that they would like to utilize. Um, so it's interesting because, you know, is this professional development or personal development? Is this something that's like a hobby that they want to explore and take a painting class and is just going to help with their creativity and feel more refreshed? Um, or is it something that's more in line with their technical skill set for their job? Um, or maybe even getting an executive coach or a mentor and paying per session for that person. Um, so just a few, definitely good to state up front and have clarity what personal development is and is not. You don't want to have a person spend the 500 and then request a reimbursement and then you tell them that it isn't eligible. Um, so I would definitely try to create boundaries around what is and what is not considered personal development. Absolutely. And I, I uh, agree with that. And I, I, I think you're spot on. And I think I just want to reiterate two points. First, you know, Raphael says personal development, but I think um, the way the question is framed, it could be that there's maybe using personal and professional development interchangeably. So really clarifying that uh, and to the point of what is and is not personal development or professional development. Um, one of the places to start, if you're looking for a place to start, is really to look at the values of, and the mission of your organization. Um, and that can be a starting place in terms of determining what are the types of things that may be eligible or ineligible for this pool of funding. Um, I think also a good place to start too, even before you get to budget or even dispersing funds or even announcing this, is really to take a step back and to really assess um, what do people actually want, right? So actually asking that question, this can be in the form of an organization-wide survey. This can be in the form of team meetings or one-on-ones with folks. Really getting a sense of what do people want, what are their their major pain points, uh, and then determining what the structure of this looks like before you get into that. We're going to give each person X amount of dollars um, because it what you could end up in a situation where it may be well intentioned, but you end up maybe not using. Um, or utilizing resources in the best way they could be used uh, because there wasn't clarity about what the need was and what the intention was. So, so um, Raphael, we want to thank you for, for your question. And um, hopefully some of what we shared is, is helpful for you in terms of figuring out how do you move forward based on what you have. And also just want to finally just want to congratulate you and your organization for actually seriously looking at this and putting your budget and your funds um, where, where your mouth is. I think that's critically important um, for us to be doing, particularly in this particular time where it's harder and harder to uh, retain talent because we're competing against other sectors with more um, robust resources. So we wanna thank you for your time today. We wanna thank, thank you, Mui, for joining us all the way from Peru. Um, I have been your, your facilitator or your host today, Miko Marco Whitlock from Mindful Techie. And so we are, just so excited that you've been able to join and hope that you found value in what we have shared with you today. And again, we wanted to just take a quick moment to thank our presenting sponsors. And also we wanted to thank the exclusive sponsor for um, this Q&A, the Fundraising Academy at National University. And we want to invite you to stay connected. So if you're interested in staying connected, learning more about um, this show, previous shows, future shows, we wanna invite you to pop open to um, the nonprofit show.com. Um, you can also pop open to American Nonprofit Academy as well and get access to additional resources 
um, that are going to be helpful for you in terms of the work that you're doing with your nonprofit. So thank you all for joining us. Wishing you happy Friday and a great weekend.